Um, hello, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and students who participate in the following seminars with their camera on or use a profile image are agreeing to have their video or image recorded solely for the purpose of creating a record for participants in the seminar to refer to, including those enrolled students who are unable to attend live. If you are unwilling to consent to have your profile or video image recorded, be sure to keep your camera off and do not use a profile image. Likewise, participants who unmute during the seminar, our class participate orally are agreeing to have their voice recorded. If you are not willing to consent to have your voice recorded, you will need to keep your mute button activated and communicate exclusively using the chat feature, which allows participants to type questions and comments live. Um, go ahead. Uh, should we do an introduction? No, uh, just uh, Richmond, we don't have time for all of this. I prepare, but uh, we don't have time. Richmond, why don't you in two minutes tell us about yourself? Um, hi, everyone. Uh, you already know my name, Richmond J. Forger. Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm in the sixth year of the PhD program at Graduate Center, and I'm doing my dissertation research on uh, over-the-counter uh, market microstructure. And your main advisor is Professor? My main advisor is uh, Professor Christos Giannikos, and uh, my committee members are Professor Sakmarov and uh, uh, Professor uh, Abinagbe, uh, Commission. Um, Richmond, please feel free to share your screen if you want to. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. I see it. So, let me do a full screen. Okay. So, um, I've been through the introduction already. Uh, my uh, paper is on empirical analysis of equilibrium and over-the-counter trading networks. Um, so, um, I would start with uh, an introduction which uh, includes uh, a description of the OTC market structure, um, then go through the research objectives, literature review, and then present the model and estimation methodology, and then um, results analysis. So the market structure um, in OTC markets uh, exhibit frictions as in all other financial markets. Uh, and in the OTC market, one important source of friction is imperfect competition. Uh, imperfect competition implies that agents are no longer price takers, but that their own actions do affect equilibrium prices, uh, giving rise to strategic behavior in these markets. Um, and uh, one of the main uh, effects of imperfect competition is uh, what researchers have come to call price impact of the agent's trading activity. Um, and in the OTC markets, um, trades occur in a bilateral interaction among traders. So each trade has two counterparties, the buyer and the seller. So because of um, the bilateral nature in these markets uh, is a great imperative for strategic behavior uh, in OTC markets. And uh, various equilibrium models have been developed, uh, including ones that reflect the strategic behavior and imperfect competition between the trading frictions. Uh, and however, empirical analysis of these models have only calibrated or uh, performed comparative statics, which I, I doubt would qualify to be called empirical analysis at all. Um, so in this study, um, uh, the study proposes to perform direct economic, uh, econometric estimation of the parameters uh, of an OTC trading network. And um, being able to successfully um, conduct such an estimation would help us uh, characterize the interplay between uh, tra the trading network's properties, the attainment of uh, equilibrium, and strategic behavior of traders in this network. 
So specifically, the research objectives are um, to gain the following insights. Does the transaction data reflect the theoretical equilibrium? Uh, to what extent does uh, private information drive observed transactions for the OTC network being studied? And does the theoretical models representation of dealers' strategic profit motives reflect in the data? So uh, with that, I would uh, give a brief description of the literature, uh, which uh, approaches the subjects um, in two main strands. There is the strand that uh, focuses on models, OTC market structure as um, a random such a match um, uh, undertaken in which traders are randomly matched and trades occur as a consequence of investors divergent asset allocation needs. So a trader goes to market and he randomly searches for a counterparty to trade with. And um, um, because of the random search and match nature of that approach, uh, they're able to impart dynamic behavior to the modeling um, that uses this uh, approach. Um, because uh, when uh, um, a trader or an investor goes to market and then backs on uh, Search whatever information they're able to learn all the way through the steps of the search, they're able to incorporate into the next stage of uh, the search, which is the dynamic behavior I'm talking about. Uh, the alternative is the network approach, which takes into account the, um, which takes into account um, the long lived trading relationships through which they trade. Um, so the second approach essentially assumes that trading relationships are not found through random such a match approaches, but rather the trading relationships already pre-exist and uh, investors coming to market reuse these same trading relationships again and again to execute uh, trades. Now this study focuses on the latter approach which says that uh, uh, relationships are not random. And further uh, down, uh, further through the paper, um, the presentation, I would um, um, go um, do a, a comparison between a random networks and uh, non-random networks to bear out that fact. Um, so in the network approach to OTC market structure analysis, um, the focus on strategic behaviors are uh, more pronounced uh, compared to the random such a match approach where the dynamic behavior is more emphasized. Um, so there is a paper, uh, 2018 paper in Econometrica by uh, Anna Babas and Peter Condor, um, which directly models the bilateral uh, strategic relationships in uh, networks where private information is the mechanism that drives endogenous information, um, endogenous formation of asymmetries. So um, information diffuses through the network through by virtue of the fact that people have private information and they interact with other people and um, they have views about, you know, how to perceive the information that they glean from the other people that they encounter. Um, beyond that, there are uh, other uh, strands of work that have um, focused on information asymmetries in markets. Malamud and Rostek has a paper, 2017. Um, Unicos, uh 2012 has a paper which also looks at information asymmetries. In the markets and Wang 94 uh, also does work on information asymmetries, but uh, these uh, other strands take a different approach to how the information asymmetries are formed. Uh, and these, these uh, their approaches are different from the private information driven uh, formation of information asymmetries. 
Um, and um, in the empirical literature also, uh, Kokogil and Shackmer of 98 uh, does some work which looks at information asymmetries in uh, relationship to how uh, they uh, drive prices. So essentially, uh, there's a view that um, uh, trade flows, volumes of trade and uh, the differentials uh, sort of carry information. And uh, Business Binder 2006 uh, did similar work. Uh, Holyfield 2017, Lee and Sheriff 2019, they have all performed um, or used the notion that um, um, uh, uh, differentials and um, uh, trade volume flows uh, reflect information asymmetries in markets. So that sort of um, gives us a view of um, the various of, um, thinking that are uh, the various forms of thinking that's gone into how information asymmetries form in the marketplace. So um, for this study, we are taking the approach uh, by Babas and Condor in their 2018 paper, which is based on uh, private information, uh, driving uh, endogenous formation of uh, information asymmetries. Now, in the Babas and Condor's paper, um, they model risk neutral traders. And by the way, all traders in this model are dealers, right? So they model dealers within inter dealer networks and how they interact with each other. So um, we let SI be uh, the private signal of trader I, um, comprising a common valuation of the traded asset. Uh, big trader. Now, common valuation being that all traders within the marketplace would have um, a component trader that they share all across. So, although the uh, trader has a trading signal S superscript I, that trading signal has a component theta that is common across all dealers. And then there is the eta i piece, which is specific or idiosyncratic to the trader i. And of course, there is a, a, a measurement error term, uh, epsilon i, for uh, that trader's observation of the uh, valuation signal. So if we let rho be the square of the correlation of valuations across the various dealers. So essentially we're saying uh, dealers uh, valuations, theta superscript i are correlated and they are correlated by virtue of the fact that they share a common component, which is big theta. So the extent to which uh, the cor this correlation exists is expressed by rho. So that, and um, the structure, the information structure, which would reflect this correlation is the one here at the uh, bottom of bullet, uh, the middle bullet, bullet point, which is that the big data is distributed by uh, as normal, uh, zero, mean, and variance rho sigma squared and the eta term is also a zero mean and uh, variance one minus rho sigma squared so that at the end of the day the theta superscript i term which is the sum of big theta and eta has zero mean since they're in, um, um, they're both normally distributed we can sum uh, uh, the means and then the variances uh, we see that they, uh, of course, because the, the, there is no correlation between uh, big theta and eta i, we can sum them directly without worrying about a correlation, any correlation term. So when you sum them, you find that uh, theta, small theta superscript i has a mean of zero and variance of sigma squared. So, so this here represents a decomposition of um, theta superscript i into the common 
value component, which is big data, and the idiosyncratic component, which is A to I. And then, of course, there's obs the observation um, signal observation error, which uh, also has a variance that is based on scaling uh, sigma squared. Now, these are all parameters that will be estimated in the uh, estimation process. Now, uh, we further um, um, model the network lengths of dealers in the uh, trading network as a graph. And a graph can be represented by its nodes and uh, its edges. So the representation for a graph is a tuple, which with uh, one, the first component, the nodes, which represents the individuals within the network and the edges, which represents the connections between the individuals in the network. So um, if we let uh, G, uh, the tuple G and E represent the entire over the counter network, then any dealer I would have their own trading network, which is G superscript I and E superscript I in the tuple, which is a subset of the entire network. So if the dealer is connected to everyone else uh, in the network, then uh, this becomes the full network itself. Otherwise, it'll be a subset of the full network. So that uh, gives us the graphical representation of the network. Now, what are the demand functions like for traders, the traders in this network? Um, so for a trader I uh, trading on uh, with another trader J, um, that trader I would have a demand function uh, represented this way. Um, Q superscript I, subscript IJ, uh, which is essentially a function of that dealer's initial uh, valuation signal, which we talked about over here, the initial valuation signal, which is SI, and we've uh, identified the compo components of this valuation signal already. Now, that valuation signal appears here again. Uh, it is, uh, so the dealer's um, demand depends on his own valuation signal as well as a vector of prices that he sees from other dealers in his network. So remember, dealer I's network is represented by G superscript I and the edges, that is the nodes in his network and the edges are E superscript I. So this price vector is P super, uh, subscript GI, meaning it represents a price vector of all other dealers in dealer I's network, right? So his demand depends on his own signal and what prices we, he sees in his network. And those prices are all uh, themselves an in indication of you know, what those other dealers have as their signal, uh, their valuation signal. And that formula is given by uh, this here in the, you know, on the right-hand side with the, def uh, the components of it are defined here, uh, T superscript I sub IJ is the trading intensity of the trader and at the um, introduction slide, I mentioned um, a term called price impact, uh, which uh, occurs in the OTC markets. This trading intensity is the inverse of price impact, actually. So just uh, warrants uh, a mention right now. And um, each, each dealer I would have uh, a number of these functions, these Q, these demand functions. Assuming dealer I has 10 other dealers in his network, then you have one such demand function for each of those 10 dealers. So 
or the demand of dealer I is actually a vector of quant uh, demand quantities. And each component of that vector is given by this equation. So keep that in my back of your mind. The prices are vectors and the quantities are also vectors. Now, uh, each component of that quantity vector is this. So um, what else haven't I uh, described in this equation? So I mentioned trade impact. Okay, Y superscript I is the weight that trader I puts on his own valuation signal. So each, um, each dealer, before they, uh, they, um, they execute a trade, they essentially embark on a bargaining process, call it a bidding process in the over-the-counter market. So after each round of bidding, they would refine their view of what the value of the asset is, right? So they go into uh, uh, this bidding process at the outset with an a priori signal, which is their own valuation signal as superscript I. And they apply a certain weight to that signal. And in addition to that, they will be refining the view of this, the value of the asset from all the other signals they, they see in their own network, and which, that, which is represented by the, um, the prices P super, uh, subscript IK. Now this price vector, P subscript G super I, has its components here, P, I, K. So now you see why the, um, the demand function is represented as um, having arguments or depending on S, I, and P, G, I, because here you have the price vectors in here. So um, you can think about the demand of dealer I as um, you know a posterior in the Bayesian Bayesian learning uh, parlance is a posterior uh, view of the valuation of the asset with a prior distribution of his own valuation and uh, which he refines further by learning from other dealers in the market. So that is the demand function. Um, and next we go to the market clearing conditions uh, in the marketplace. Now, like uh, I stated at the outset, trades take place as bilateral transactions between two traders. So each, um, each uh, trader link Will have its own market clearing condition. So um, for a trading link IJ, the market clearing condition would be the sum of the demands uh, on that link by the dealers and um, the demand by customers who come to this trading link for uh, um, in our trading services. So you can think about uh, beta IJ as um, being made up of two components and it actually reflects the preferences of customers that come to, the selection of customers that come to this trading link IJ uh, to trade. And um, you, uh, beta IJ is made up of two components beta, which is the, um, um, the uh, marginal utility of, you know, uh, all customers in general. And then mu IJ is a markup that the dealers on this link charge their customers. And so at the end of the day, that represents the slope of the uh, demand curve and beta would strictly be less than zero. So it will be strictly negative uh, for the slope of the demand curve to be 
um, negatively slogan. Now, uh, dealers, there is neutral dealers in the market. Um, as they go through the various bidding rounds to uh, finalize what trades to execute, they solve a linear uh, Nash equilibrium in demand functions. So you have your demand function as this, and you're gleaning signals from other dealers to refine your valuation of the asset. And while you're doing that, you're looking to maximize your expected, this expected value. That's what they're looking to maximize as they go through the process of, you know, bidding and, you know, um, bargaining to uh, enter into a trade. And the process of uh, maximizing this uh, utility or uh, this objective, if you will, is uh, what is called the OTC game in this, um, in this study. So the OTC game being the over-the-counter game is essentially a price discovery process where dealers, you know, pursue various rounds of bidding to determine what final trades they should enter and how much quantities and prices they should, you know, submit in those trades. And um, they do so by this maximization and in, uh, they do it in a process called the OTC game. Now, solving the maximization problem above yields um, yields of um, the following um, relationships. PIJ it would be the price on the uh, trading link IJ, and it is essentially um, you you can view it as um, um, a weighted average of the posterior uh, uh, views or uh, the posterior beliefs of the traders engaging in this trade. So the traders engaging here is trader I and trader J. And uh, their posterior beliefs after going through the various rounds of bidding then becomes the expected value of theta I which is, if you recall, theta i comprises the common valuation big theta and the idiosyncratic term eta i. So they still have uncertainty. Remember, eta i is an uncertain uh, term. If let me go back and show you what it looks like. This is eta i. It's an uncertain term. And it adds on to the common value term to give us theta i. And we want the expected value of theta i. So that's what you know uh, each dealer is trying to determine the expected value of this term conditional on his own starting signal and all the prices he's seen in his network over the bidding rounds. The same applies to this dealer. So uh, the price at which they trade is a weighted average of the expected as uh, the posterior beliefs of what the assets valuation is, right? And of course, uh, the uh, denominator is adjusted by um, the slope of the demand curve for their customers on that trading link. So as you see, you know, after going through the maximization and determining the uh, first order conditions, second order conditions and all of that, we still don't have um, a recipe for determining what these posterior beliefs of the traders are, which is the expected values of theta 
i and theta j. We still don't have them, right? So they still remain unresolved. Now let's call them, let's call these expect, uh, expected values small e uh, subscript i. Now, Richmond, you have a question on the chat by Yanis. Um, yes, uh, Richmond, uh, my question is, I, do you assume that all the traders have equal initial endowments? Because I think the initial endowment would play a role on... So here, there is, um, there is no initial endowment per se. The, and, and that is one uh, uh, way in which uh, this approach varies from the other approaches uh, to uh, generating endogenous information asymmetries. And as I mentioned here, uh, there are other approaches to you know, uh, thinking about information asymmetries. Uh, Malamud and Rostec, uh, their approach takes initial endowment into account as one of the drivers of information asymmetries, right? So in Malamud and Rostec, uh, the um, our distribution of initial endowments is, 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 is key and uh, also uh, preferences is key. And, um, but here, the main in BK, in the BK model, the main mechanism driving information asymmetry is private information, right? So private information being the component of theta i that is idiosyncratic to the trader i. Now you could you could uh, go further to think that um, perhaps you know, uh, the dealer would have to be resourced in some way to be able to acquire that private information. And so the quality of that private information will depend on the resources that dealer has, or maybe the initial endowment that that dealer has to be able to afford, you know, that private information. And that could be reflected also in the, uh, the noise term, sorry the noise term here, the observation uh, noise of trader I. So although there is no, um, there is no explicit way uh, uh, in which initial endowments have been uh, represented in this model, it could be reflected somewhat indirectly in other components of this construct. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Okay. Um, actually, while we're on this topic, um, you've mentioned so far that uh, you have risk neutral dealers. Um, how many different types of dealers do you expect in the model? Uh, different types of dealers here. Um, well, in some models you have, um, you know, uh, dealer types delineated based on their risk preferences, you know, high type, low type, whatnot. Uh, again, here, uh, dealers are not uh, uh, differentiated by, you know, such discrete dichotomous, you know, delineations, but rather it's a continuous sort of uh, uh, um, uh, approach to describing uh, dealers, and we'll get into that in a moment. Okay. And that is that 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 is part of you know the mechanism driving uh, information asymmetries in this model, and it is the uh, information diffusion parameters. So in every um, bilateral interaction, one counterparty views the other to be a certain type, and the other counterparty views this other one to also be a certain type. And that is reflected in how much weight they put. And let me go up and show you that in the formulation of the demand function. You see here, the Z, I case, these are weights that 
de la I will place on the signal he sees from de la K in his network. And that is based on how de la I views de la K, Z I K is based on how de la I views de la, de la K. If he thinks of de la K as more resource, less averse or more averse or whatnot, ZIK summarizes all of that, right? And that essentially, uh, de la I uses uh, these coefficients to determine how much value to place on the signal he gets from de la K. So at the end of the day, these Zs act as the agents by which information diffusion takes place in the network. So, gotcha. so you have a continuum of types and preferences and not discrete, you know, A or B, black or white. It's a continuum. And that would be endogenously estimated and determined uh, in the estimation process as well. I'm sorry, I, I have just a couple more questions on this okay, this point. Um, so that's okay, exactly that's the idea that uh, you challenge the speaker and then uh, he will learn from it how to present it uh, in the journal um, and elsewhere. Uh, Richmond, can the dealer play their own book? Like they have assets outside of this job and can they, in this model, do they, you know, um, based on the information that they have, they, they think, oh, this is a good investment. Um, is that tacked onto this model or it's just not important? Oh, so um, that would, if, if you're saying, uh, so you're asking the question whether they would trade for their own account, principal right. trading sort of, if you will, right? Yeah. So. Uh, at the end of the day, that will be reflected in the dealer's uh, profit motives, right? The dealer's profit motives. And that comes down here to this maximization equation, right? If the dealer thinks that, why would anybody own an asset? Even if that person is not a dealer, they'll buy it so that they can sell it higher for a profit at a future time, right? Right. And that will be reflected in theta i, which is um, the common values plus that dealer's own idiot private information, right? If the dealer has private information that says this is a good investment, right? They'll buy it and hold it until a point when they want they, they think they can make a profit out of it. So it, it will be that would be reflected here, although it's not explicitly laid out, it would be intrinsic here in this uh, uh, um, maximization um, um, sort of um, setup. Okay. Uh, and then just one last thing. Uh, we haven't really talked about, we've spoken generally uh, about the markets and stuff like that. I mean, is there any insurance? Uh, like I know in terms of like options, if you were to uh, if you were to do it at the CMB, like the underlying institution, if you can't meet the liquidity necessary, there is insurance. the The institution will help you out. Um, I mean, is there anything like that in here? You, you mean financing for yeah. uh, purchasing um, an asset? Uh, I mean, like uh, your your dealer, if they if the market kind of goes crazy all of a sudden, I mean, it's it's different in uh, institutionalized listings, um, but um, market makers are required to to perform in the market regardless of what's happening. Um, right. But uh, in this case, yeah, I, I guess I'm I'm wondering if there's any sort of equivalent or if there's insurance. Um, which is sort of a separate question. Um, yeah, well, I'm, I'm not sure well, the kind of insurance you're talking about, but um, in uh, over-the-counter markets, um, I guess traders trade 
primarily off of uh, relationships, right? So um, you go to market, you want to trade. Um, there is RFQs, which is re request for codes. And um, these days there are some, you know, um, um, some liquidity pools that you could go to, to, you know, um, um, sort of uh, find the liquidity that you need. And uh, once you have uh, found it and, you know, you want to engage in a, a transaction, I guess, you know, there are various back office operations that are undertaken to complete a transaction, right? Um, and of course, in various markets, there, are, there could be financial arrangements, which is separate, right? Such as if you need, you know, to finance your trade using, you know, some collateral that you own, you probably go to the repo market to do that, to uh, execute that kind of, um, you know, uh, transaction there to get the funds to uh, finance um, the trade that you're trying to uh, get into. Now, as far as explicit uh, insurance, like options for um, these securities, there are no um, um, options on, um, you know, of course, some OTC markets will have options. If you go to the corporate bond market, some specific issues would have, you know, some options traded, but generally, um, you know, dealers would, uh, you know, look to insure against broad types of, um, you know, uh, risk uh, classes, such as maybe interest rate risk or uh, market uh, credit risk using maybe credit default swaps or, um, you know, swaptions, for example, uh, to protect against interest rate risk and whatnot. But um, beyond that, I don't know if um, any other insurance that might exist here. I don't know if uh, that answers your question. Um, it, it, yeah, mostly does. Um, I was thinking about the crisis, I think, that occurred uh, in the 90s due to long-term capital management imploding. And, okay. Um, I, if my memory is correct, at the, uh, the CMB in Chicago, um, they ended up having to close the markets for a period and then get funding from the Fed just to match the order book appropriately mm -hmm. so um yeah yeah so if you are a dealer if you're a dealer of course you can you you have um uh, the you enjoy the privilege of being able to go to the fed to the fed window uh either the discount window or in the um uh what's it called the overnight funds market uh where the funds rate uh, apply to source funds right so uh, in that, even in that respect, people think about uh, the Fed policy tools and rates as a put option, right? Um, in the marketplace in the sense that, you know, it, 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 it can protect you or even help you against, you know, margin calls, for example, right? When you need funds, uh, emergency funds, right? So definitely, yeah, that exists for everybody, uh, including, the uh, operators in the OTC market, but you would have to be able to post some collateral and um, the Fed would have details about the various programs that they are undertaking at any given time. And at the present time, they have, they have programs which include being able to post, you know, products from the uh, products that trade in the OTC market, such as MBS pools. If you own MBS securities, you can post it as collateral to borrow uh, in the funds market from the Fed, right? And um, and there are various other types of collateral that could be used, right? And uh, which are also collateral that trade in the OTC market. So in that in that sense, yes, uh, you there is that insurance available for okay. um, products that trade in the OTC market. And those in that's in this model, just to be clear, like it. We've, we've been very general so far. So. 
yeah, in this model, um, you don't necessarily, you don't have an, uh, um, you don't have an explicit representation of being, you know, how you are going to deal with market stress or market breakdown, right? That will be reflected primarily in uh, your trading intensities, right? So if market is experiencing stress, people will trade less and less, right? The intensity will be lower, right? And um, uh, that's um, uh, also uh, an, um, a repercussion of market impact, essentially. So your market impacts are gonna be very high and um, that means liquidity is drying up, right? So that is uh, sort of the tangential uh, sort of reflection of stress in this model. But the model is not necessarily one for studying stress specifically, but stress is reflected in uh, trading intensities and market impact. Thank you. Okay. So um, I went through the equilibrium formula for price as a weighted average of the posterior beliefs of the traders undertaking it. And so the next um, issue to deal with is figuring out how to resolve these posterior beliefs and determine exactly what they look like. Because so far, we only know that it's an expected value of theta i. We don't know the specific value, how to resolve it yet. We don't know how to get this expectation resolved. One way to do it would be to solve a, a conventional, which is the conventional approach, would be to solve a fixed point uh, problem in the space of n by n matrices. And I think, well, one of the questions that were submitted uh, relates to this, that how does uh, a fixed point problem in an, a space of n by n matrices uh, get solved? Now, it, um, to give you some intuition about uh, why that is the case, let's go up to the demand functions. Remember, the demand function here is Q superscript I, which is um, the demand, the, the scalar demand of dealer I on the link, the trading link IJ. Now, dealer I has N of these functions, right? So dealer I's demand is actually a vector. If you have N dealers in the marketplace, that vector would be an N vector, right? Now, not all entries in the, in the vector N will be non-zero. Some entries will be zero, corresponding to the other dealers that dealer I is not connected to, meaning dealer I will not have demand uh, on that bilateral link because he's not connected to them. But we are talking about an N vector, N column vector for each dealer. So if you have n such dealers, that's an n by n uh, space of functions, right? So uh, that's how you get to your n by n matrices. So uh, in the marketplace, the demand, all of the aggregate of demand in the marketplace is represented by uh, uh, a matrix that is n by n whose components are demand functions, right? And um, to be able to solve for equilibrium, you, mind you, you are trying to resolve these um, terms in the demand equation, right? You resolve them, you have to resolve them, find an algorithm to resolve them, um, you know, uh, uh, iteratively, until you get to a point where the demands in each cell do not change anymore. And that will represent equilibrium, right? And that will represent a fixed point, right? So you need an algorithm to be changing the 
uh, components of each demand function so that each demand function changes in each step of the building bidding process. Remember, the OTC game is made up of bidding steps which constitute the, uh, the Bayesian Nash equilibrium, right? So at each stage of the bidding process, you refine uh, the components of each cell in the end by end matrix. And you iteratively do that until you, know, you get to a point where the values are not changing anymore. That will be your fixed point. So that's why this involves solving a fixed point problem in the space of n by n matrices. So uh, I hope that sort of answers the question that um, the student had. Um, so instead of solving the fixed point problem in the space of n by n matrices, uh, Babus and Kondo introduced um, a methodological innovation they call the conditional guessing game, which uh, sort of uh, sidesteps the process of having to solve the fixed point problem. And they prove in their paper that the conditional guessing game converges to the solution of uh, the full-blown solution. And I'm not going to go into that. I'll refer you to the uh, BK paper uh, for details on the conditional guessing game. Now, I'll, I'll just um, uh, present the main results of the conditional guessing game. Um, so from the conditional guessing game, you would have other uh, posterior beliefs that we saw up here. Remember the posterior belief, which is the expectation, is now symbolized as E sub I, right? So we would have each, um, we would have each E sub I represented by this equation. Well, mainly the terms in it are going to be rep represented by these equations. Um, there is a yi and there is a zi. And the conditional guessing game equilibrium has yi represented by uh, a yi that is barred. And that the, the equation for the barred yi is this. And the equation for the barred zi is that. Uh, I think. Um, um, how am I doing on time? So I know. What... Uh, I don't know. You you need to tell okay. me when you want to finish. I see you okay. so, by 3 p.m. at the most. Okay. All right. So I guess I'm good. Um, but uh, so what, what I suggest to Richmond in general is uh, to be less technical because not everyone can follow all the equations. Okay. So you need to put a lot of English into the equations. Okay. So okay. essentially, this is the um, uh, conditional guessing game equilibrium uh, representation uh, in concise terms. And um, uh, for my part, I found a way to represent the uh, uh, results of the conditional guessing game in a way that it can be solved. And I'll, um, it can be solved by some analytical method to obtain the, the equilibrium posterior beliefs, which is what we still have unresolved. So I constructed a system of equations here where you have a vector. So it's a vector matrix equation. You have a vector of posterior beliefs expressed in this form. And you can solve for the posterior, the vector of posterior beliefs by you know, uh, rearranging terms and inverting this term here, which is essentially a matrix, right? You invert as uh, a matrix inversion problem. And um, one point, one main takeaway I want to emphasize here is that the matrix Z, which I will describe further, is the matrix of uh, the Z the IJ terms, which are the weights on the um, the weights that each dealer 
puts on the signals that he's, he's getting from the other dealers in his network. And um, so looking at this term here, which is the identity matrix minus Z, we represent that by U and U can be de decomposed uh, in this manner. And um, so there is a proof to show that U can be inverted. And that is in the paper, it's in the appendix. If uh, anybody has read it and has questions about it, I, I will take those questions now. Otherwise I'll skip uh, this uh, technical point. Okay. All right, so Richmond, what I suggest you um, in general is to put like a roadmap of what you are doing without even giving the equation. So people will be able to follow, you know, point by point what you're doing. Because all of this equation, of course, uh, we looked at them as a committee member, but it's difficult for the audience. Okay. For... All right, thank you. So um, um, inverting U essentially gives you a solution for the uh, equilibrium posterior beliefs of each trader. And once you have those uh, posterior beliefs, you can uh, have the uh, equilibrium prices and quantities in the network. So these are the equations that we saw before. Um, well, the equations we saw before included uh, TIJs, which are the trading intensities. And the trading intensities themselves depend on the uh, information diffusion parameters, Zs. So from here, you can see that knowing your Zs and your betas completely characterizes the network because uh, knowing your Zs and the beta, which is an exogenous parameter, you are able to determine what the equilibrium price should be and you're able to determine what the equilibrium demand quantities would be. And that essentially solves your OTC gain. So with that knowledge, um, we'll go further to look um, a little critically at um, what this means. Now, at the outset, we mentioned that, uh, and there was a question from the audience about what um, information asymmetry mechanism was at play here and if you know, uh, initial endowments were taken into account here. Now, in this model setting, um, the primary mechanism for information asymmetries is private information. Um, and the equation we just saw just reflects purely private information. It does not account for any other mechanisms that we might know of, which could also cause information asymmetry. So, the next step is to try to identify ways to augment uh, this private information equilibrium that uh, Babas and Kondo had derived so that uh, when we take the model to the data to do estimation, um, our results will not be clouded by the presence of other mechanisms driving information asymmetries and then, you know, causing us to not be able to see uh, the observations clearly enough. So here, I uh, mentioned um, uh, Gianico's 2012 is uh, a paper which, you know, uh, uh, approaches uh, indigenous information asymmetry uh, creation by uh, identifying high and low uh, risk preference types in the marketplace. Uh, uh, and that sort of goes to one of the questions that uh, uh, someone in the audience also raised, you know, that this is an example of um, a paper that takes that approach. And also I've already mentioned Malamud and Rostek taking an approach which says that uh, private uh, information asymmetry could be driven by initial endowments and risk preferences. And also uh, similarly with Wang 1994. Um, the outcome of these other approaches is the fact that 
uh, traded quantities uh, can, you know, changes in traded quantities are a manifestation of, you know, information asymmetries in the marketplace, which give rise to market impact, meaning they cause prices, market prices to change. And those are reflected in, in the empirical work of Coca Gill and Shark Maroof, which did um, a study of the futures market abroad across many different uh, traded uh, futures um, markets and, um, you know, bore out uh, that observation. And um, Besson Binder, Holyfield, Leah Sharos, they have all also used uh, this notion that uh, differential traded volumes carry information asymmetry consequences and cause prices to change. So um, in the final analysis, um, again, to ensure that these other uh, mechanisms of information asymmetry do not cloud the observations that we want to make, uh, we, we, we seek to find in the estimation, we augment the price equation by uh, a trade, a trade fix effect, which is delta Pij, and a security specific fix effect, which is uh, referred to here as an intercept A. So intercept A will be the security specific effect for security A, and the trade specific effect delta Pij will be um, for security A traded on the trading link IJ. And that is added onto the Babasan Condo equilibrium price uh, that was derived up here. This which here. One, which one, I don't see in your presentation uh, the references. So you need to add them because you are quoting all of these papers. Um, so the readers will want to know what they are exactly. Okay, so you mean the full references for all these for others? All, everything uh, that you mentioned in the presentations. Okay. But okay, let's move on. Yes. Okay. And the traded quantities are also um, augmented by a similar uh, uh, empirical component, which uh, sort of mimics um, an excess uh, uh, demand curve by taking the uh, 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 trade specific effect and multiplying it by an exogenous demand, excess exogenous demand factor, which is beta ij. So the term from the price equation drives the quantities equation to essentially mimic what uh, the literature, what has been observed in the literature that uh, differential, um, uh, differentials in trade volumes has relationships to, you know, um, you know, price impact or essentially permanent price changes. So this essentially reflects that notion. So these would be the final equations that are estimated. And then um, the various components would seek to characterize the various components in the estimation results. The components being the information, private information component and the empirical component, which we clearly see here. So this is essentially just a description of the equation that I just presented in the previous slide. And um, Now, beyond uh, augmenting the inf private information equations with the empirical component to reflect the other mechanisms that could be a play to drive uh, information asymmetries, we also have to think about how the network is going to be used um, in estimation. Because if you think about the formulation of the network, um, it says nothing about how you go from trading one type of asset to another type of asset. 
So the formulation, if you go up here, yeah, the formulation that we have is essentially for a single asset, right? But when we have data from uh, an OTC market, you would have many different types of assets traded in that market. So the question becomes, do we use the same Zs and betas to, um, or to analyze the different types of securities that are traded, or do we vary the betas and Zs in a certain manner to reflect you know, the different securities that are traded? Now, if you're going to estimate a different set of Zs for every different security, you will have, uh, you cannot have a, a feasible estimation problem. So here, the hypothesis is that uh, the Zs and the betas do not change um, when you go from trading one type of security to another. Um, the Zs are uh, essentially uh, a characterization of the long-lived relationships that exist in the network, but not necessarily uh, a reflection of the different securities that are being traded. So that is the uh, uh, notion that had to be put across and then tested also in the results. And um, the what would be looked for in the results to determine whether this uh, assessment uh, assertion holds is uh, to determine, to look at what the posterior distribution of the parameters will look like. Of course, here, uh, the approach being uh, proposed is to use a Bayesian uh, estimation approach. And in Bayesian estimation, you get uh, a measurement of the uncertainty of the parameters as well. So the notion is that in the posterior distributions of the parameters, if different securities really require different parameters to be used, then the posterior distributions of your parameters are going to be all over the place. The distribution, this uh, dispersion is going to be very wide and to the point that they will be so diffuse and almost useless. However, if this assertion that the same network in place can be used across different securities, then we will expect that the dispersion of the parameters after estimation would be, uh, will be low. So we'll look for that in the results. And of course, if, um, if we see that the dispersions are too high and almost useless, then one approach that could be take, taken to handle that kind of situation is uh, the regime, Bayesian regime switching in uh, Agbe Egbe and Goldman, 2005. There is a, uh, uh, they um, uh, present some work there on Bayesian regime switching. So um, that is the view going into um, the estimation. So with that, I would uh, describe briefly what the uh, uh, Bayesian estimation setup looks like. And of course, uh, it uses a hierarchical probability model um, for uh, estimation. And these are terms that we've already seen at the beginning. Um, the dealer specific signal, which we previously saw as SI, now has to be specified to be for a, a specific traded asset. So for a specific traded asset A, the dealer specific signal for dealer R will be given by this, where um, we know that eta R uh, and, um, and epsilon R are both dealer specific terms that we've already described. And here, theta hat uh, is the common value term. And at, in the opening slide, that common value term 
was distributed to have a mean of zero. But here, we're giving it um, a non-zero mean, which is also uncertain, and we will learn from the probability model what that value would be. And we're taking the view that actual traded assets in the marketplace have uh, non-zero nominal values. But in the model, which is a theoretical model, they use a zero mean without loss of generality. So here we are going to do away with that assumption and give it uh, a mean value that we will learn and also analyze in the results to see what it looks like. So uh, keeping track of the things that we will want to see, first we want to see the standard deviations of the parameters in the uh, results, what they look like, and whether or not the assertion that using the same network parameters is a good assumption. And two, we want to see what this mean value looks like for the common value distribution. Mean of the common value distribution. We want to see what it looks like. And uh, study its behavior. And we'll look at the common value itself and how it behaves. So we are going to keep track of these items and look at them in the results. And of course, we want to look at uh, the extent to which uh, you know, private information drives the information asymmetries here. And how do we measure that? We measure that by rho, because rho is what tells us the degree to which uh, asset valuations are common in the network. So if rho is high, it means private information is low. If rho is low, it means private information is high. Okay, so with that in mind, we'll go through the formulation very quickly. And unless anybody has specific questions they wanna ask, I will not um, dwell too much on the technicalities of the equation. But I will just mention briefly that uh, for the Bayesian, Bayesian estimation, uh, a method called Hamiltonian Monte Carlo with no U-turn sampling is used. Uh, there is a, 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 a brief uh, overview of that in the paper. Um, if, if you've read it and you have questions, I will take those questions now. Otherwise, I will skip it and go ahead. Okay, I'll go for it. So this essentially um, it just uh, presents constraints that we need to be um, uh, uh, aware of going into the estimation. Um, the Zs must be in this interval in order for the second order condition of the maximization problem to be a maximum. That's a condition and you can solve that and you find you find this problem, uh, you find this condition out. And why i's must also be greater than zero because uh, for any dealer to be participating in a trade, they must have some positive view of their own signal. And rho must also be between zero and one. So these are uh, conditions that are enforced on the parameters in the estimation. And of course, these are um, the initial um, uh, distributions that are posited for uh, the various components uh, that we know we want to study. The PIJ is data, QIJ is data, and then S is the uh, dealer's individual signals. And I'm gonna skip over this, this is more um, uh, probability estimation setup, more probability estimation. Um, and this is the higher car probability model itself. It's, it's, uh, it sort of traverses a couple of pages, two or three pages. Unfortunately, I couldn't make it shorter. Um, so if anybody has um, specific questions they want to ask about the higher car probability model, I'll stop and take those questions. Otherwise, I'll go forward.
Okay, so I'll skip and go for it. Um, so now the data description. Um, the data that was used for estimation comes from the municipal securities market. Um, um, the data was acquired from MSRB, which is the municipal, municipal securities regulatory board. Uh, they have uh, uh, a regulatory mandate to collect um, trade information from the municipal uh, bonds market. So um, uh, through a subscription, I was able to acquire data for uh, one calendar year. So that's the academic historical transactions data. And that data set is uh, only available to academic institutions because um, they have uh, dealer identities in there, unique dealer identities. And they don't want that to be available to uh, uh, non-academic um, users. So uh, participants in the marketplace don't have that information, but it's made available to academia so to facilitate uh, research such as this one. Because to be able to do this research, we had to be able to identify the various dealers trading in a particular security in the network. So that was important. So again, I want, uh, you need to put this uh, thank you for them uh, on the first page or second page of your presentation. Okay. But let's move on because you also received a question from the students, right? So you would like to respond to them. Okay. Um, may, may I ask something about the data retrieval? Yeah, go ahead, Austin. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, I think it's one of the questions that was sent by the group of students who I'm speaking on behalf of. And uh, so why did you choose uh, municipal bond data for the OTC network and not any other market? Okay, so uh, that's a good question. Uh, at the present time, there are uh, three different markets that I know of which have this kind of data. There's the municipal bond market, there's the, uh, which is available through MSRB. There is the corporate bond market, which is available th through Trace. And there is also the securitized bonds market. And that is available also to trace. And for each of these markets, to get data for each of these markets, you have to go through extensive, um, um, uh, an extensive application process and uh, assessment, legal evaluation, and all of that stuff, right? So it takes time. It took me almost a year to get this data. And um, so, uh, I randomly selected the municipal bond market first, and I was hoping that time permitting, maybe do something with uh, corporate bond market, but you know, um, that is if uh, it doesn't take me more than a month or two to get that data, but at this point, I probably won't. So to answer your question- You also, you also paid for the data, right? Partially. Right, right, I paid for, uh, we pay for it uh, by a grant. From, so we uh, applied, Anderson. right, we applied for a grant or a, Richmond applied for a grant and it was approved by the director of the program in order to get some kind of a discount. And I think it cost like $500, right? Yeah, $500 for the initial setup because Graduate Center hasn't purchased data from MSRB before. So we had to go through a, an extensive process. First of all, you go to QC Global, get a license from them to use QSIP identifiers before MSRB would even consider your application. So after that, then MSRB will set you up, you pay $500 for that. And then after the setup, then you can start buying data. So now that we've been set up with MSRB, if we go back to want to buy uh, additional data, it'll cost us $500 per calendar year. So um, yeah. That's what it is. We don't have to pay the setup fee in it again. And it's the same story with Trace. You pay a setup fee of $500. And then once you're set up, every calendar year costs you $500 to buy. Yeah. 
And the data is also restricted on the computers, right? You cannot transfer the data? Or do you... Yes, there are the restrictions. Yes, there are restrictions there. Um, so, um, they ask you to submit a list of, you know, individuals that would have access to the data based on where you're going to be using it. Nice. And so at one point I was made to submit the names of all graduate students in the PhD, um, uh, economics PhD uh, program to the legal department at MSRB. They reviewed it and then came back to me and they whittled it down to a shorter list. And so it's a long process, a lot of legal red tape. Right. And this year, this year we are, this season we are lucky, quote unquote, because of the coronavirus, they are less restrictive as it, they used to be. So yeah. getting the data is expensive uh, time-wise and also money because the, the, the program, and C Professor Cristo is not around, um, the program does not have money, right? So the $500 was maybe the whole budget for uh, acquiring data. Yeah, and so uh, I was allocated a budget of $1,000 to be able to even get it. Uh, 500 for the setup and 500 for the data. But okay. today, now that we've already had the setup, if you go back to buy data with $1,000, you can get two calendar years. As long as you do it uh, within calendar year, right? Yes. Good. Okay, thank you, Professor. So again, it, so so again if the students who are interested to work on this uh, issue, I'm sure that uh, Richmond will be happy to collaborate with you. Yes. Well, uh, actually, part of our seminar, Richmond, is to uh, interview the speaker one-on-one -on -one to learn about, especially you as a recent graduate of, of your experience in performing like, the first steps of your research, et cetera, et cetera. So um, at a later stage, later this week or maybe next, uh, would you be available for a brief interview? Sure, yeah. I'll yes, sure. Don't worry about it. Uh, we don't have time for this, Austin, at this point. Richmond. Richmond, okay. you have like uh, 17 minutes, so go ahead because okay. I want to. I want everyone to see your empirical stuff. Okay, all right. So I'll move full speed ahead um, uh, with the data processing. So um, I created a subsample of the data with only trace of uh, per amount of uh, one million dollars or more, um, and this is to reflect what long-lived relationships exist in the uh, trading na network. And there is precedence for doing, uh, taking this approach. Holyfield uh, in their work, which was on uh, the securitized market, um, they used a criterion for uh, a total, uh, a total per amount traded of 5 million in their sample period. And for them, their sample period was also one calendar year, like mine. Um, the difference between uh, our approaches for determining the long, uh, identifying long-lived relationships is that in my case, I use a per transaction, per transaction criterion, whereas in their case, they use a, a cumulative transaction throughout their sample period. And uh, because of that, um, I kept mine to um, uh, you know, a threshold of 1 million, whereas this is at a threshold of 5 million. So I used that to create a subsample that reflected uh, pre-existing trading relationships. And uh, that subsample created, uh, uh, contained a total of uh, 221,000 uh, trades uh, with uh, a total of 1,398 unique dealers and a total of 12,309 bilateral uh, trading interactions uh, throughout the sample period. So uh, judging from the fact that you had a total uh, trade count of over 200,000 and bilateral interactions of 12,000, meaning there were a number of repeat interactions, bilateral interactions. And that is a good indication that the network represents 
pre-existing relationships because in pre-existing relationships, you have people going back to the same person over and over. So, um, and also uh, to control for the fact that we don't want, um, we want to identify uh, securities uniquely and not um, sort of sidestep the issue of market movements. We constructed, um, we use the QCIPs. QCIPs are identifiers for securities. They are unique identifiers for securities. Uh, so to make our transactions even more unique, we create, uh, we uh, appended each QCIP with a time, the calendar date on which it traded, right? So if a QCIP traded on December 1st, 2020, we add that date to its QCIP identifier to create a unique identifier for that trade. After doing that, we had uh, over 15,000 unique QCIP IDs in the 221,000 trades. So again, here we see that each QCIP traded you know, several times within the network. Um, so this is a visual representation of the network. Um, I created this using uh, PyVis, which is a Python program a package. Um, and um, the legend on the right says that the more central a dealer is in the network, the um, that dealer is represented by a red ball that's a large. And as the dealer becomes more and more peripheral, in other words, less and less central, the dot, um, the ball representing that dealer becomes a smaller dot and the color changes to blue. So you would see all the connections in there, you know, represented by those rays of yellow. And um, that's a visualization of the network. I believe, Richmond, you had before some kind of a more schematic one. Did I miss it or is it uh, in, your, in your, this presentation? Uh, more schematic, like how the dealers interact with each other and so on and so on. So some kind of a network that you want to show. But okay, yeah, I, I think right. I, I think I think that was in um, a different paper. That yes, which which has uh, uh, they essentially picked randomly picked only a right. few nodes in the network to right. so that you could see how the dealers interact. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, if that's that is if, uh, useful informationally, I can. Uh, or create something like that. Right, and you need also to tell the audience that uh, there are all these very small dots, which are this peripheral, but uh, again, uh, okay. people should be aware of it and see what's going on. Okay. But okay, go, go on. You have like uh, five minutes and then uh, I will give five minutes for Austin okay. to ask the question. So yeah, this is the um, uh, grid distribution of the network. And uh, there was a question um, about or why I did not conduct a Smenov uh, uh, growth Smenov test on this. Uh, uh, typically in the network literature, um, people want to see whether uh, the network is um, uh, follows a power law. And uh, essentially for a network that follows a power law, uh, the log log, um, uh, the log log plot of the uh, degree distribution will be linear, which is what we uh, we wanted to um, show in here. So yeah, of course, uh, 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 a Como gross man of test will be useful in determining also that it's not a random network. And so I included uh, a Como gross man of test here. Um, and now go into that in detail. So what I'm trying to say is that this network is a scale-free network, as you would see in Jackson, 2008. And uh, the preceding plots show that it's a log-log and it's a parallel uh, network. 
Okay, Richmond, you have four minutes. This is the span of comma growth test. It shows that they are different, it's different from the theoretical. Um, so I'll go, now I'll go into the results. Um, as you can see, the first, the first thing I want to highlight in the results, and as I indicated, we want to see how diffuse or uh, 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 spread out the posterior distribution of the network level parameters are. And if they are extremely scattered, they are extremely spread out, then it means our initial assumption to use the same network to trade different securities is not a good one. But here you will see that the network level parameters have standard deviations that are uh, fairly low all across. The standard deviations are almost always smaller than the mean value. Of, and these are, this represents the posterior distribution of the parameters. We have rho, we have sigma. We remember these uh, parameters from the initial setup. So uh, that's the main point I want to make with this slide. And I'll go on to, uh, okay, this goes further into that. And the main point from this slide is that the a row of 0 0.55 corresponds to a correlation of 0 0.742, which is the uh, common values among dealers, right? We wanted to find out about that. So meaning we have just over 20% of private information in the network, right? And uh, of course, Lee and Sheriff's 2019 paper, which is Journal of Finance paper, uh, says that they found that uh, private information is low uh, uh, as a driver in the municipal bond market. So this bears out that point. So um, uh, that's one other um, takeaway we wanted to have. Now, the next thing we want to look at and I'm I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, you have you have you have one and a half minutes. I want to leave Austin five minutes. Okay. So here, um, I mentioned that we want to look at the mean of the common value, which uh, and also the common value itself and how it relates to. Uh, so here we are uh, um, assessing uh, the convergence in the conditional guessing game against the reality on the ground. And this data slide essentially tells us, uh, uh, explained here, and I'll, I'll go to the main points, that we find that traded quantities correlate possibly, uh, positively with both uh, buyer and seller uh, conditional guessing game signals, right? And uh, um, they, uh, uh, they correlate more aggressively with the buyer than the seller. Why? Because when the signal is stronger, it means um, you know the buyer has a greater incentive to buy, and the seller has less of an incentive to sell because he's uh, letting go of something good and might be in a constrained situation. That's why they're letting go, and that essentially uh, aligns with um, our intuition that. You know, um, a residual demand curve should be negatively sloped. So okay, good. So could okay. you go? Could you go to the last uh, slide? Not the thank you, but one before it, the fifty-three, I think, and just uh, make give us a conclusion. Very okay. Quick. So here essentially shows us that the deviations from the uh, private information. No, no, a rich one. I really want you only to go to slide fifty-three. Your last one, oh, you one before the last one. Conclusion, yes. Okay, okay. So in the foregone, we've shown that the equilibrium parameters of an OTC trading network can be estimated using Bayesian inference and uh, uh, Stan software. And also that the endogenous parameters provide useful insights that um, we can use to uh, understand more the strategic behavior within the network. Okay, great. Uh, Austin, go thank ahead. You. Okay, thank you, Professor, and thank you, Richmond. Um, so <clears throat> following up with the question sent by email yesterday, and on the same note you're talking about estimating this, can you go to the previous slide? 
Sorry? When you go to the previous slide, the last statement you had right at the bottom. Yeah. So it says, it is quite evident that the ability to estimate such endogenous parameters of the OTC network provides more insightful observations than would otherwise be possible. So on the same note, uh, we have a question regarding of the market technicals or fundamentals that sometimes influence the price of these um, instruments. Yeah. And you find that the, I'm going to copy and paste the question, but if you find the, this estimation of parameters consistent with these exogenous drivers. So I, I, I pasted the, the question. Um, Hello? Yeah, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so your question, if I, I get your question right, um, you, you are saying, uh, you are asking how do market technicals uh, sort of uh, feature yeah. in this uh, context and how uh, the insights gained from this you know, are relevant in the interplay, right? That interplay with market technicals. Yeah, that's great. Right. Okay. So the main takeaway here, and I'll go back to the convergence charts, right? The main takeaway here is that um, these are the convergence, convergence for traded quantities versus centrality, right? As centrality increases, you see that uh, convergence to the equilibrium values uh, become very precise, right? In that these on the y-axis, you have the deviations from equilibrium, the private, uh, uh, the CGG equilibrium, right? If you go up further, you see a similar behavior for prices, traded prices, right? So the takeaway here is that you can have um, various phenomena in the marketplace that causes deviations from the equilibrium levels, right? But uh, those would affect peripheral dealers more than they will affect central dealers. So the more central a dealer is, the more shielded away they are from information asymmetries. And most of these technicals uh, reflect information asymmetries in the um, marketplace, right? So the main takeaway is that the more central a dealer is, you know, they don't get you know, affected uh, as much by um, you know, any deviations that will be in induced by technicals, for example, as you mentioned, right? Okay, great. So yeah. I would like to thank everyone. I'm sorry that we don't have time to do more because we are all sitting here from 11 a.m. It's already 3 p.m. So we are like almost uh, four hours with about 10 minutes break. So I would like to thank uh, Christine and the uh, Professor Christo and all the audience and the student, of course, and uh, see you all uh, next week with uh, Finn Kidland. Uh, thank, you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Richmond, we will talk on the phone later on. Okay.